Hey everyone, I'm Aaron Porras, and thanks for joining us for ILTV's weekly program, One on One with Alan Dershowitz. We want to give you, our viewers, the chance to have your questions answered by Professor Dershowitz, one of America's greatest legal minds. He's a leading expert on criminal and constitutional law, civil liberties, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. And today, we have a special edition of the show where we recapture the finest moments in commentary, bringing you the best of One on One with Alan Dershowitz. With us in the studio today is Tsipi Livni, who recently resumed the role of opposition leader in the Knesset. And of course, among the highlights of her distinguished career, which started in the Mossad, she helped found the Kadima Party and has served in various positions, such as Minister of Justice and, of course, Acting Prime Minister. So let's open with a topic which has been grabbing headlines in Israel and the U.S., the recently passed nation-state law. Tsipi, would you like to begin? Oh, yes. Uh, Israel was established uh, 70 years ago as the nation state of the Jewish people with equal rights to all its citizens. This is the Declaration of Independence. This is the nature of the State of Israel. These are the values of the State of Israel. Equality, in a way, is the hyphen between being a Jewish and democratic state because love thy neighbor is part of our uh, Jewish heritage, while uh, it's also part of uh, the democratic uh, values or the, the base of democratic values. And therefore, I believe that what is written in the uh, Declaration of Independence should remain as our legal guideline, as our constitution. Uh, <coughs> this law, in a way, took just, this basic law took just part or one side of this equation speaking about Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, and Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people, but in a way left behind uh, the values of Israel or equality and all uh, um, uh, or the part of the Declaration of Independence related to the democratic values of Israel. And therefore, we voted against it. Professor Dershowitz? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, to thank uh, Leader Livni for our coming on the show. She is one of the most important uh, women, indeed one of the most important people in the world. Uh, her efforts to achieve peace through strength uh, is uh, in incredibly commendable. She has served the people of Israel in so many different capacities. I am so honored, uh, uh, Tippi, an old thank friend, you. to have with me on, on the show. Thank you. I completely agree with you. I think that for the 70th anniversary of Israel, they should have passed a basic law simply incorporating the Declaration of Independence. Uh, if they were to pass another law, it surely should have included reference to the other basic law that does proclaim equal rights for every citizen of Israel. But to pass a law that simply reassesses or restates the uh, nation state of the Jewish people without restating the equality can create the wrong impression. Having said that, I, I think the reaction to the law by Israel's enemies has been way, way over the top. How dare any uh, Palestinian or member of the Palestinian Authority quarrel with this new law when the Palestinian Constitution provides for a Muslim state uh, under the laws of Sharia without equal rights for its Jewish uh, residents? Almost no uh, Middle East country can compare with Israel, and many other countries of Europe uh, have statements very similar to those in the law. That doesn't make it right. It just makes it wrong for the critics of the law to use it as a way of shouting slogans like apartheid and fascism and, and racism. Those are over the top and wrong uh, just because the law itself could have been done in a better way, and I think it could have been done in a better way doesn't justify the kind of criticism. I think that Tippi Livni's criticism is exactly pitch perfect, the right tone. Uh, she supports the concept of the nation state of the Jewish people. Uh, she is a great Zionist. And that's the way the tone ought to go in this, in this debate. So uh, thank you, Alan. I, I want to share with you that what we are going to do is to put another bill uh, hopefully that we can vote for it, saying that basically the Declaration of Independence is a basic law. And therefore, this puts together both sides of the same equation, Jewish 
democratic state all together in one bill in a reference to the Declaration of Independence, and I believe that this is the right thing to do. At a recent speech in West Virginia, President Trump created quite a stir, well, at least in Israel, saying Israel would have to pay a higher price in negotiations with the Palestinians in return for his recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Noy Dagan is a recent graduate of the IDC, the Herzliya Interdisciplinary Center, and sent a question for you, and let's hear from her. Shalom, Professor Darshavitz. My name is Noy Dagan, and I currently live and work in Jerusalem. Like most Jerusalemites, I felt personally involved with the U.S. Embassy move to our city. Now, I wanted to ask you, Professor, do you think President Trump's recent statement that Israel will pay a higher price for Jerusalem Embassy move is a tactic statement made to reconcile the Palestinians who have been pretty upset with the U.S. administration, or a part of a greater strategy for getting a peace deal? And by the way, Professor, I just got back from New York and Boston, and people didn't care about Jerusalem there. They cared about a much more important conflict. Who do you think will win, the Yankees or the Red Sox? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think the Red Sox are on their way to a glorious, glorious season this year. Uh, I certainly hope so. Um, on the issue of the serious issue, of what the president meant. I think the president's a deal maker. And what he was really saying is, look, I gave something to Israel early on in the process, the recognition of Jerusalem. I don't think he gave anything. I think, look, Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel, and America was obligated to recognize that. But the point he was making was there is going to be back and forth and negotiation, and Israel's going to have to give some, and the Palestinians will have to give some. Prime Minister Netanyahu made the same statement. He said that both sides will have to make painful compromises. I think that's all the president really intended. Israel will have to make some painful compromises, particularly when it comes to uh, settlement building. And uh, we'll see what the plan is as it unfolds. But I hope it will be good for both sides and, and good for peace. And I hope it's a plan that all the Sunni Arab countries in the region will embrace and that ultimately the Palestinians will feel they have no choice but to accept. You can't have a two-state solution without the Palestinians sitting down and negotiating. It's not going to be imposed from outside, either by the United States or by the United Nations or by any other entity. It has to be a result of a process of negotiation between Israel and the Palestinians. That's been the American position since uh, the beginning of time, and I think that's a position that uh, President Trump will embrace as well. Jacob? Yeah, well, um, President Trump said this before. So I don't know what to make of the timing. Um, John Bolton, who uh, was here, uh, National Security Advisor, just said yesterday here in Jerusalem that there's no timetable. So uh, I don't know, what's, you know what, what to make of the timing. But I'll tell you more than that. Uh, I don't see anything really happening in this direction. I see the, in Jerusalem the, the right-wing Israeli government very confident that they are totally on the same page with the Trump administration on everything, uh, the Palestinians are not, been, are not even speaking with the Americans. There's no dialogue between the Palestinians and the Trump administration whatsoever. The Palestinians are in a totally non-starter position here. So, uh, you know, if Jerusalem is off the table, as the president said, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, what's, what's there? What, what's there? Uh, evacuation of, of settlements? Unlikely. 67 borders, even highly unlikely. Uh, I don't know, armed forces for the Palestinian state? I don't think so. A lot of money from the Saudis or somebody else to the Palestinians? Maybe, but it's not enough. Uh, so let's see what happens. You know who says this. Let's see what happens. I don't see anything happening anytime soon. Hey, let's talk about the anticipation of President Trump's unveiling of the deal of the century. Now, most recently, America announced it would stop supporting UNRWA, and then more recently, it said it will close the Palestinian office in Washington, D.C., until they get serious about negotiating. So we recently came across a series of brilliant op-eds written by a Ph.D. candidate at King's College London. I caught up with the author, who incidentally is named Avi Yeager, and he's working at the IDC Herzliya, where he manages the Argov Fellows Program, named for the late Ambassador Shlomo Argov. So not surprisingly, Avi actually at one point served with my own, talking about young leadership, talked, uh, he served as, a, uh, as an officer with my own son in the IDF. So.
I'd like to ask you, uh, Uzi, a question. This will lead us into the question about leadership. And uh, Avi paraphrased a famous saying made by President Reagan in which he urges Abbas to just say yes. So let's hear from him. Shalom, Professor Dershowitz. The argument that I make is that throughout the years, Palestinian leadership thought that time is working for them, or in fact, time is working against them. From the Oslo Accords to the Camp David Summit to the Annapolis Conference of 2008, the Palestinians have been asking for more. In reality, they have been offered less. 43% of mandatory Palestine in 1947, less than 20% in Camp David, and now they are offered even less a confederation between a Palestinian and a Jordanian state. Even Arab countries have started letting go of the Palestinian cause, shared security interests, and growing demand for Israeli technologies in cyber and water desalination have brought Arab countries closer to Israel's doorstep and further away from the Palestinian cause. In my op-ed, I ask, when will the Palestinian leadership wake up and start saying yes? The Palestinian cause, yes, viewed objectively, is a, a third or fourth level human rights cause. Certainly not nearly as strong as the cause of the Kurds, not nearly as strong as the Tibetans. Uh, these are really displaced and disenfranchised people who have never been offered the opportunity of statehood. The Palestinians were offered statehood in 1937, 38, 1947, 48, uh, essentially 1967, essentially 2000, 2001, 2008, and they have uh, never, uh, never said yes to opportunities. Uh, the only reason the Palestinian cause is front and center in the world is because uh, the nation state of the Jewish people, Israel, is perceived to be their oppressors. Take, for example, Jeremy Corbyn. He claims to be a human rights activist. He never speaks out on the other causes involving human rights, only on the cause of the Palestinians, or many, many on the left only speak out on the cause of the Palestinians. It's not because they love the Palestinians, it's because they hate the nation state of the Jewish people. And I think that's becoming old news. And I think the Palestinians really do have uh, a, a tremendous interest in now coming to the negotiating table. And President Trump, I agree with some of what he does. I disagree with some of what he does. But I think putting pressure on the Palestinians through UNRWA and through the office in Washington can possibly produce positive results. Look, I think the movement of the embassy to Jerusalem proved a positive result because the rest of the Sunni Arab world was fairly silent about it. And it took a very, very important issue uh, off the table. And I think the time is right for the Palestinians. They will get a good deal if they come and negotiate. And if they don't, this stalemate will continue for many, many more years. It's a self-inflicted wound by the leadership of the Palestinian Authority. And it's a wound that can be healed if they come to the negotiating table and get a good deal as Prime Minister Netanyahu said it will require painful compromises on both sides. Israel has already indicated a willingness to make painful compromises. The Palestinians must be willing to make the same painful compromises as well. One year ago, uh, the morning after the horrific violence at Charlottesville University, University of Virginia student Jeremiah Rosman sent a question about the meaning of all this. We caught up with him a year later. Perhaps ironically, he was now working in Washington, D.C., and had witnessed the alt-right demonstration that was supposed to be a follow-on to the original racist demonstration. So let's hear what he has to ask. Hello, Alan Dershowitz. Jeremiah Rosman here, PhD candidate at the University of Virginia. I asked you a question last year following the uh, tragic events in Charlottesville, and I wanted to ask you now, I currently work in Washington, D.C., if you think that the small turnout at the Unite the Right rally this past week is a sign that uh, divisions in uh, the nation are healing. I, I wish I could say they were. I do not think that's right. I do think that we're seeing extremism both on the right and on the left grow. And the one thing extremists on the hard right and the hard left have in common is their dislike for Jews, uh, their dislike for uh, Israel, for anything Jewish, anti-Semitism is a constant on the hard, hard, hard right, the David Duke right, and on the hard, hard, hard left, the Jeremy Corbyn left. And so what we're seeing is the middle middle being uh, squeezed out and the extremes uh, being empowered. Um, the reason, I think, for the small turnout was probably the fear of violence. Washington, D.C. is not the best place 
to have an alt-right demonstration. I do think that we can expect, if you look at the internet, increasing, not decreasing, uh, radicalism on, on both sides. And my, my wish for the new year is that we can strengthen the center, uh, move Americans more to the traditional debates between liberals and conservatives rather than between radical leftists and radical rightists. But I'm not optimistic because if you look at trends around the world today, we're seeing extremism growing all over the world, not all over, but in many parts of the world. We saw extremism defeated in France during the election, perhaps in Australia and Canada and in a number of other places. But in Eastern Europe and in uh, many other parts of the world, we're seeing extremism grow. And that's a for me, a dangerous phenomenon. So I appreciate your optimism. I wish I could share it, but I don't unfortunately share it. You know, in Israel, they say that a pessimist is one who says, oy vey, things are so bad, they can't get any worse. An optimist is one who says, yes, they can. Uh, mm -hmm. When it comes to extremism, uh, I'm an optimist. I think things can get worse. Joining us today is Avi Sakharov, who is an award-winning Israeli journalist known for his focus on Palestinian affairs and as an analyst for the Times of Israel, Walla News, and Haaretz. He holds degrees and has taught at Ben-Gurion University and Tel Aviv University and has authored two books and is the proud father of a 12-year-old daughter. Now, most recently, Avi has achieved worldwide acclaim as the creator and co-author of Fauda, perhaps the hottest Israeli show ever to reach American and international TV. So here's a quick reminder. Uh, this is actually the courtesy of Yes TV. This is the program which is also an award-winning show in Israel's 111 uh, Ophir Awards, which is the Israel's Emmy. So Avi, welcome to the show, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you, Danny, and thank you. And hi, Ellen. How are you? I'm doing great. I remember the last time we met in that wonderful hummus restaurant in, in Yafo, and we had a good talk with my grandson, and I watch your show. I wait every day for it to come back to the next season. It's an amazing show because it humanizes everybody. It humanizes the Palestinians. I remember in the restaurant, there were many, many Israeli Arabs, and they treated you like a hero because, although in the end, without giving away anything, in the end, the Israelis usually prevail. Uh, the humanization of the Palestinians and the humanization of the Israelis, they're not perfect. They're not, uh, they, don't, they don't get it right every time. Um, it, it's just wonderful, not only television, but wonderfully projects the complexity of the situation uh, in Israel and in the Palestinian Authority. So Avi, can you tell us about the show, how you became involved? And uh, especially for those who don't know, what does Fauda mean? Fado means chaos in Arabic, of course. Uh, and it's a kind of a very known um, word in Arabic on the Palestinian territories because it describes a situation in which Palestinians were living in, especially in the years of 2000 to 2006, the years of the Second Intifada, where you could find many militants, people with guns, terrorists on the streets of the West Bank and Gaza, but you couldn't find the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority wasn't really functioning, wasn't really operating. And instead of that, what you've got were militias, gangs, uh, gangsters, uh, people with guns that did whatever they felt like. And that's, that word, Fauda, became like a cultural issue, meaning they wanted to describe, the Palestinians wanted to describe 
a situation, a specific situation, that was the word for the big balagan, as we call in Hebrew, for the situation on the ground. Now, I bumped into this uh, project almost by mistake. I mean, I wasn't a TV creator. I'm a journalist, like you've mentioned before. But around 2010, uh, I met by accident my partner in crime, uh, Leo Raz, who's the head character, of course. And uh, we started to discuss the option of creating a TV show. We knew each other since I was 16, and I had long uh, curly hair. <laughs> uh, he too, by the way. <laughs> and uh, we had an idea of, you know, talking about this phenomenon of the undercover units that are operating part of the IDF in the West Bank. It used to operate also in Gaza Strip. And to talk not only about them, but also about the Palestinian side and what's going on among the Palestinians, Hamas, Fatah, Palestinian Authority, etc., in the West Bank. And we managed to create a show that describes uh, a hunt, a chase of an undercover unit team after the biggest terrorist of Hamas, which is called Abu Ahmad, in the first uh, season. Let's hear from one of Fauda's favorite binge watchers who visited your set, Avi, uh, and he was looking for a role that he could play, but he spent some time with the cast. Let's roll it. Very exciting for me to come here and see you guys. And what I've never lost after all these years of being in show business is when I'm a fan of a show, when I see the people in person, I'm like, oh my God, it's them. What I love about Fauda is that the characters from every single viewpoint are represented. It's addictive and it doesn't matter what's happening in your life my wife was giving birth when i was watching one episode and i'm like i'm busy and you know you take care of that on your own okay so finally uh we want to celebrate some few things here today alan uh and one of the things is we have the 100th show not of fauda but the 100th show of the one-on-one -on -one with alan dershowitz okay uh -huh. and besides being the 100th show we have something even even more interesting, it's also, well, I'll just leave this go here. It's also your 80th birthday. So Mazel here we go. <laughs> so Alan Mazel Tov. Uh, and Thank you. You know, you missed my 80th birthday in Hebrew. I was born on the eighth day of Elul, and my bar mitzvah sedra was Shoftim, Tzedek Tzedek Terdof. So, so I'm already 80 in Hebrew. And I'm three days away from being 80 in English. So I'm older in Hebrew than I am in English. <laughs> and I think I'm wiser in Hebrew than I am in English. So it's uh, a very fitting that I should be older under the Israeli or Jewish calendar than I am under the uh, American calendar. All right, that wraps up this edition of One on One with Alan Dershowitz. If you'd like Professor Dershowitz to answer your questions, please go to ILTV.tv or our Facebook page and submit them. We'll see you again next week.